is Mariana Vargas from Instituto de Física. Well, her talk, which is part of Quantum Fest slash Colloquium, Colloquium <laughs> 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 so of the Department, is about the uh, this recent announcement. Uh, but this year announcement. <laughs> uh, Harrison work. <laughs> I was the first measurement of the neutrino in the bow spectrum. Okay, so let's start. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the very nice short presentation. I appreciate. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry. I apologize for being late. Um, I didn't measure quite well the time, so I'm sorry to be late earlier with the colloquium. So I'm very happy to be here, part of this uh, event that is happening this week, that is the quantum test. Uh, this colloquium is not about quantum physics, precisely, but it's about cosmology. And I think a colloquium should, should do that, should open new, new different points of view of the physics for all the people. And that is the idea of this colloquium. So um, I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, colloquium. And in particular, Pablo, but it was his idea to, to come here and to present his work. This is a, a, a recent work that we published in February, and uh, it's about the first measurement of neutrino in a, in a place where it was not measured before. That is the new thing of this work, and this is what I'm going to explain today. So, the, the real title of the paper is a little bit more technical, and this is exactly the title that I put in the abstract. So if you read it, what we measure is a phase shift, and I'm going to try to explain during this seminar what I mean with this measurement. So, <coughs> before starting, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a prelude, and I, I'm going to give to one message that is outside the science of this talk. And this is more about how we do science. And it is related also with this work. So um, what I'm going to present today is the result of a collaborative work. So I'm going to highlight here um, the value of collaborating with people. So I think this is an important message to pass to the students. I, I see there are many students here. So I really want to encourage you to, to, to do collaborative work. And you will see why that is important, this work. And uh, this is uh, the collaborators that we work together for doing this work. And I separated into blocks just because I want to highlight another thing. So this block of this side is people that is basically doing theory, theory of the early universe, that had a strong background of uh, particle physics. And this side of the pictures are people that have been involved in experiments in dark energy, in particular in experiments related with spectroscopic surveys, of BOS, EBOS, some of them are on DESI, if you have heard about DESI, some of them are in LSST, that is also a new experiment that is going to come next decade, uh, some of them are also in, involved in Eclipse. So we have a really variety of people working in spectroscopic uh, experiments. And just putting together these two expertise is that we are able to do this work. So the second message is in the same direction, and it's, me, it's just saying this work is about neutrino physics. Neutrino physics is complicated. And it's complicated because we need, as many other uh, research fields, we need to put together information from astrophysics, from cosmology, and from particle physics. And so that is the reason we need to put together people from different backgrounds and expertise. So, having said that, that is not real science, but it's the way we do science, uh, I'm going to go directly to the outline of this talk. So, I prepared three blocks. The first block is an uh, introductory part of cosmology. I'm going to give very few, very short introduction of what are the important ideas of cosmology that are relevant for this seminar, uh, with a particular uh, emphasis in the, in the places where the physics are, are related, related with neutrinos. In the second block, I'm going to explain carefully what are the acoustic oscillations. That is the phenomena that is behind all these measurements, and I'm going to uh, explain at the end of the talk. 
So I will be introducing the CMB, probably you have heard about. I'm also going to talk about uh, bionic acoustic oscillations, that is where we measure this. And once I introduce all these concepts, we are ready to go directly to the measurements. So the, the last block, that is more or less half of the talk, is going to be uh, about how we measure this in a particular set of data, that is BOSS data. I'm going to present what is, data, what is BOSS data. And at the end, I'm going to present some forecast. And this is just so, uh, as I'm mentioning in this forecast, the experiment of uh, four generation DESI, I'm going to explain uh, why we like this model, was we like because it's the simpler model that we can use for describing the universe. You can describe the universe just using six parameters that historically fits the, these six parameters are, are expressed in quantities that are related to the CMB because the CMB is one of the most important observables that we have in cosmology. Probably is not the best model and probably is not the final model. We know that, but that, that is not the main point. It's the best description that we have today and this is what we are using. Um, I like this phrase of pivot just because also we are also very happy in cosmology for the Nobel Prize to people. He just want to like to say that any theory is right. It's just all the theories are incomplete and we are trying to approximate to the theory uh, little by little. So this model consider uh, these components. We know that the 5% the of the universe is our ordinary matter that we in cosmology call bionic matter. We know that around 25% of the rest of the density energy is uh, dark matter. Um, we don't know what it is, but we, we know that it's required for many of the phenomena that we observe in the universe. So we have several indirect evidence of this dark matter. And the rest of the energy, that is a lot, is dark energy that we also don't know what it is. So um, I'm not going to use dark energy yet, like using a particular model. I'm just referring dark energy in the sense of this standard cosmological model that is a, 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 con a constant uh, lambda. And uh, in general, I'm going to be using this term just as a synonym of uh, evidence of the cosmic acceleration that this is what we observe. So this model also includes, or oh, suppose, are initial conditions. So these initial conditions are provided by the inflation, inflation mechanism. And with this mechanism, we can provide this power spectrum that is invariant of scale that will be important to put the seeds of the structure that will develop through gravitational collapse later, late in the universe. <coughs> So this is the idea of the model. When I say that it's very successful, and when I say it's because it's, it's in agreement with most of the observables that we have, I put most because probably you, will, you can tell me that there are a few out there that are in the small tension. But in general, what we are gonna find when we look at the observables and look at the parameter space is that the different observables with completely different systematics when we put them together, all of them converge in a very small region of the parameter space. And this is what we like to, to, to mention as the agreement of all the observables with this model. So uh, in general, I like to present this table that I prepared myself. So uh, these are a list of observables that are in favor of the lambda CDM model. And they are uh, separated, clustered, by colors that are indicating the part of the model that they are supporting. So here, for example, in green, we have all the observables that are related with the dark matter. Here, all the observables that are related with the dark energy, with the primordial universe in orange. And in blue, we have the observables that touch bear many of the parameters of the model that are very uh, robust and they are providing uh, a lot of information about our cosmological model. So um, that's, that is the status of the cosmology today. So if we believe this model, what is the picture that we have of our universe? So we know that the universe is expanding. 
we know that this expanded in an accelerated way recently. So if we extrapolate this idea to the past, we will find out that the universe was smaller and shorter and denser. And in the different, as, as, as much as the time passes, the universe expands, and the universe passes by different transitions. So I'm not going to go to the, all the eternal history of the universe. This is not the scope of this talk. But I'm going to focus in two periods of this timeline that are important for this talk. So one is happens um, at one megabyte. And uh, we are going to start with that. So we are going to focus in this part of the history of the universe, but we have already the neutron and protons formed, and they are extremely, uh, and they are weakly interacting uh, with all the neutrinos and the electrons, and they are forming a kind of plasma, right? So as the universe evolves, they it gets colder, and then. Uh, these interactions will continue to happen until the time of the ratio, ratio of the interaction is going to equal the whole, uh, the whole expansion. At this moment, these particles will stop interacting in an efficient way, and then we will, we will say that the neutrinos decouple from this plasma. And these neutrinos that decouple at this moment in time is going gonna, is gonna to represent what we measure in this work. That is the neutrino background, or neutrino relic that uh, you often see in the literature. So neutrinos that were emitted very early in our universe. And if you make the computations, you can, you can, you can know that this happened about a second, uh, when the, the universe was just one second old. So this is the neutrinos that will travel after this decoupling without interacting with anything else. So uh, for us, for the cosmology, it will be very interesting to measure these neutrinos, just because if we can measure them and they were not interacting since then, they are transporting information from the very early in the universe. So it's giving us like a picture of the universe when it was very young. So we were very interested, we will be very interested to measure this. But the problem is that these neutrinos have a very small energies. And if you compare it with all the different sources of neutrinos that are coming from other astrophysical processes, you will see that we have orders of magnitudes uh, below uh, that we can measure today. So I'm not an experimentalist. I don't know how we can measure neutrinos in a direct way very good. But what we know is that even for these guys, it's very difficult to measure it. So for those, it's almost over. So we don't know how to do it now, at least now. So um, that reminds me this um, this phrase of Paoli that was at the time when he uh, predicted the neutrinos. Um, he mentioned at that moment, and this phrase is very famous, mm -hmm. is that I have done something terrible today. I predicted, and this is something that no theoretical people should do. This thing, I suggest that something that can ever be verified experimentally. So he was wrong. He was not mentioned in this context. But what is funny is that 30 years later, it was proven that he was wrong and the neutrinos were detected. So in our case, we don't know how to detect them. I don't know if in the future we will be able to detect them directly. But fortunately for us, we have many other ways to uh, detect them indirectly. And we are going to explore today one phenomena, that is the acoustic oscillations, where these neutrinos have an effect, an important effect, and that these acoustic oscillations have two observables. One, that is the CMB, that we know is fluctuations are very small, is a very linear observable. And in the other part, we have that we can see also this, this signature of the neutrinos in the structure of the, the distribution of the structure of the matter. And if this is a regime that is highly nonlinear, but we can also see it there. So we will see these two regimes where we see the effect of neutrinos. So why they have an effect uh, that important 
if they don't only interacted, they were just in thermal equilibrium, very little in time? Well, the answer is because at that moment, the neutrinos were a very important uh, fraction of the total density of energy, so about 41%. So that's why this imprint is, is very important. So let's go to the uh, second part, that's part of the acoustic oscillations. So for the second part, we are going to go again to this timeline. And this time, we are going to, we are going to focus a little bit later, this decoupling on the neutrino happened. So now we have the neutrino stars, they are not interactive anymore, but we have all these proton and neutrons that are interacting all the time with the electrons, they form atoms and then the photons come and take out the, the, the electrons and so on. This is again a plasma. And in this plasma, we are gonna focus now what happened in this plasma. So for this explanation, now we are going to go to the Fourier space, and we are gonna see just one mode. This is one mode, and we have that that are trying to collapse, because we have this potential, we have a fluctuation of the density, where there are more upper densities, we will have a potential, and then in this potential, the virus will try to fall down, and then there are the photons that are opposing to this movement, right? So they are like this kind of strings. They are doing this kind of generating this oscillation. So this oscillation, uh, we need to remind ourselves one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, in our standard model, we believe that we have this mechanism that is inflation that generates an, uh, a spectrum uh, invariant of a scale. What it means, the uh, spectrum invariant of a scale, is that we have generated fluctuations to all the scales. So we have fluctuations to all the scales. It also predicts that they will be Gaussian, but we are not going now to this point. So we have fluctuations in all the scales. This is the amplification of fluctuations at two different scales. And in all the scales, it's happening in the same effort same phenomena. Barons are trying to collapse and photons are trying to impede this collapse. So the important thing here is that the different modes will be related by this expression. So all the frequencies will be related just, will be defined just by the velocity of the sun and the wave and the k modes. So that means that if we have two modes, the frequency will be related and we have in a, in a harmonic uh, situation. So here we have the first ingredient. I'm going to do a small parenthesis of Gaussian random fields because we need them to understand the CMB fluctuations that will observe uh, the fluctuation of temperature. So the second prediction of the uh, inflation was that we generate uh, a Gaussian random field. The density field that we generated is a realization of a Gaussian uh, random field. So if, if, if someone studies Gaussian number fields, we know that they are completely determined by the two-point correlation function. This is what we, this equation mentioned. This is the two-point correlation function. So we are going to try to understand what it means this. Uh, the second thing is that we know that the perturbation of this density field were very tiny at the beginning, so we can separate them. Uh, as a sum of plane, of plane waves. Again, we are gonna work in the Fourier space. And we are gonna characterize them by the power spectrum. We are going to use, to try to understand what it means to say that the power spectrum is the variance of the random process governing this delta k. Delta k is the transfer, the Fourier transfer of the fluctuations of the density in the configuration space. So, if we, if we plot in this size, we have the power spectrum, and in this size, we have the Fourier transform of the power spectrum that we are illustrating here. So here, we have just one pixel of this power spectrum in two dimensions, and this is a radius that is identified by a mode of norm k. So what it means, this definition that I just mentioned, is that we can decompose all this in, in, in the configuration space. So this pixel is given by its variance 
is given a sample from a distribution that has a variance equal to the power spectrum. So if we project this again to the configuration space, we will have this decomposition of the different directions of this vector k, and what we have in all the cases will be the same frequency. So the, the, the composition around all the circumference will have this. If we move to a k mode that is a little bit larger, we will have the same situation, but this time the frequency will be different and the direction will be related exactly to the position of this vector in, in the power spectrum. So if we put together all these different contributions, we'll have the contribution of each mode k to the density field. This is for one mode k, but we can do it for another mode k when we put over all the contributions. And then if we go for each mode k, we have here the contribution of each scale to the power spectrum. This is what the power spectrum is telling us. Okay? So we can do it also accumulative, and in this way, you will see that little by little, as, as far as we are adding all the mode contributions, we will have something that is pretty similar with the CMB uh, fluctuation of temperature. So this is where everything is coming. So if you are interested in this kind of stuff, we are doing a Excellent lecture in Institute of Physica are invited. Okay, we go back to the CMB. So we were in this situation, different modes are oscillated, and we know now what are the Gaussian on the fields that we can decompose in plane waves. <laughs> now we are going to put together these two things. So you cannot see it from there, but if you pay a lot of attention, this is not fixed, this is oscillated. So if we translate this to the configuration space, we will see these plane waves that are oscillating. This is the way of understanding this. So the second element is that whatever we have this, uh, this in configuration space, what, we, what it means in terms of the plasma is compressions and rarefactions of the density field. So if we go to the the next slide, each compression or rarefaction will be associated with emission of photons of different temperature. Where there is compression, uh, there will be photons that will be hot. When there's rarefaction, there will be photons that will be cold. So that is what we, we what was missing to understand now the CMB. So we have all these oscillating modes. You are not seeing from that, maybe but this is oscillating. All these uh, the frequencies are related in an harmonic way. If we put them together, we will have this kind of field, while shown on the field, that is oscillating. You cannot see over there, but this is kind of noise that is oscillating. And if you see here, we are just making a bigger scale so you can see it more clearly. This is oscillating. And this is what happened in this plasma. This is the acoustic oscillations. So, what happened then? Well, oh, something is happening. I don't know what it is. The universe continues expanding, and then it's getting colder. And then what happened is that little by little, we will have that this photon will have less energy to interact with these atoms. And as you got, as what you are looking here is the fraction of these photons that continue being ionizing these atoms, but this is uh, the, uh, the photons that are becoming gray, that are not, not in interacting anymore, and they are called info, because as they are not interacting anymore, if we measure them, they are transporting information from this situation, early situation of the university. So at the end of this, <laughs> what we will, we are gonna have is that all the photons will be decoupled again from this plasma. And this is the decoupling of the photons, the emission of the CMB. And this is exactly what you have seen. Uh, I'm gonna go back to this later. Well, no, I'm gonna do it now. These oscillations, if we put it in the power spectrum, 
will generate this pattern. And what is gonna happen at the moment of the coupling is that this pattern is frozen. So we have this power spectrum, angular power spectrum of the fluctuation of temperature of the photons coming from the CD at the decoupling of the photons. So that is a very important observable. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's the most important observable today of cosmology. And almost all constraints that you are going to have will have something to go with this, this observable. So, I'm not going more into the detail. If you go with the detail with the details on the CMB, we know that the first big is the angular acoustic scale of the horizon, so horizon, and then the different proportion between different peaks is going to be giving information about the quantity of variance, quantity of matter, and etc. It's going to touch many other parameters. So now we have all the picture complete, and we can go directly to this film of Wayne Hook. That is exactly the same that I mentioned before, the Fourier space, but this time we are working with the angular power spectrum. But it's the same idea, the different contribution of the different scales that these times are in terms of L. Okay, so in this CMB, we have two effects that are affecting the CMB. One is the damping that I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to discuss here this effect, but I'm gonna concentrate in the phase shift. This is this talk. So how we imprint a time shift in the acoustic waves. So again, a reminder, there were a bunch of uh, new neutrinos. So the important thing here is that we need to understand that we have two species. We have this plasma of variables and photons. We know at what velocity this plasma is traveling. It's C over uh, square root of three, more or less. And then we know that these neutrinos are relativistic particles, so they are moving to the C uh, velocity of the light. At this moment, they are completely relativistic, even if they are. At this moment, no, but probably later. The, the, only, the only assumption of this, that this applies for any particle that is relativistic and free streaming, is going to happen the same thing. It's not just related with numbers. So that is an interesting thing for the third people. So if you figure out other kind of particles that have these properties, whatever they are, they will, they will have the same effect. So what happened here is that in our picture of this one mode in this potential, what is going to happen with these neutrinos is that they are interacting through gravitationally, through the plasma of baryon photons. They are, they are going away faster, so they are inducing fluctuation symmetry. And this is going to affect the potential. And it's going to make it flatter. So it's going to make that the oscillation start later in time. So if we see here in, the, in the, our, our previous plot, this is what we have in the case we don't have any neutrinos. But if we add the neutrinos, we will have a small phase shift in this oscillation. And this is what we want to measure. So I need to introduce something here. So the way that we parameterize the density of radiation is this. Uh, we introduce a parameter that we call an effective. So we have here the contribution of the photons, and we separate the contribution of neutrinos. We are thinking here that this is a model that just considers neutrinos, and this is the contribution of each family of neutrinos. So this is going to kind of tell us the number of families of neutrinos. So in the case of a, a, a model that we are considering, an effective have a value that we know how, how it, it, it's, its value for the standard model that considers three family of neutrinos. But the important thing here is that any difference of this n effective from this number that is predicted for the standard model is going to indicate new physics beyond the standard model. That's why the people from particle physics are, have a particular interest to measure this quantity. Okay, so we have now this parameter. 
And then this is the, uh, the spectrum of fluctuation of temperature that we have seen before. And this is a plot that we are varying the n effective value. And we are seeing what is the effect in, in the power spe angular power spectrum of temperature fluctuations. Uh, we don't want, there are two effects I already mentioned. So the damping and the shift. We want to isolate the, the effect of the, of the shift. We are not interested in the damping. So we are fixi fixing a bunch of quantities here such that the only thing that we want to, me to, to measure is the shift in the, in the angular power spectrum. Okay? So here we have a zoom, I think it's here, four peak, one, two, three, four peak here, of what could, how, how we can see the shift. You, you can see this very, very tiny effect, very, very difficult to measure. So the first measurement of this in the CMD was done in 2015, I forgot to mention. And uh, this is the paper. It was very important at this moment. It was the first measurement of this in the power angular power spectrum temperature. Uh, if you have the reference here, if you want to see it. If I already mentioned this. So let's go now what this work is about. So I mentioned that we measure this shift, but not in the CMB, that I already explained. We measure this in the bionic acoustic oscillation. But what is the bionic acoustic oscillation? So let's go now to explain what, is, what are the bionic acoustic oscillations. So the first thing to mention is that this bionic acoustic oscillation is coming from the same phenomenon that are the acoustic oscillation. It's just a different system that is observed through the distribution of matter of the universe, and in particular, through the distribution of tracers, bias tracers of the matter in the universe that are the galaxies. So what are the bionic acoustic oscillations? So this explanation that I started at the beginning, where I have this, uh, what these variants that are trying to, to collapse, and then the photons that are in, uh, opposing that, we are going to now switch to the configuration space uh, explanation. Why? Because in general, the bionic acoustic oscillation is more natural to explain it in the configuration space. So now we are in the configuration space. We are no longer in the previous space. And um, for the explanation, we're going to focus in one over density. This is the, this over density. And we're going to think that the, there is the only over density in the universe. And everything else is homogeneous. And then we are going to start this uh, evolution of time of our universe, um, this press, this, these two forces that I already mentioned, what are going to generate in the configuration of space analysis is an, a spherical shell of overpressure that is going to start moving from this initial over density like that. So this upper density will continue moving, moving, moving. We are going to ignore now the neutrinos. And we continue moving. We just want to mention two things here. In black, we have the dark matter. The dark matter don't moves because they are not suffering this uh, interaction of the baryon plasma photons. They stay in the center. The baryon photons are moving until the decoupling time. The baryon and photons are two different colors. They are coupled, so they move together until the decoupling time, or the photons decouple. At that time, the pressure of radiation stops, so the overdensity stops moving and stays frozen at a particular scale, that is the scale of PL. So the rest of the interaction will be, will be only gravitationally. The baryons of the dark matter will continue interacting until arrive to the final shape. That is, every single overdensity is going to be surrounded by an spherical overdensity at a particular scale, that is the BL scale. Like this. Continue moving, 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 and then stop moving. Well, this is the explanation for one over density, but if we have several over densities, we'll have the same thing. So we, have, we know that this particular scale is imprinted in the distribution of matter of the universe, but we cannot see it because we, we know that there are many over densities everywhere. So the only way, even, even further, before going to that, this is a 
pattern that was imprinted in the density of the matter. But the galaxies are a biased tracer of the density of the matter. That means that they will be formed by gravitational collapse, where those of their density were. But we're going to trace just part of this upper density. They will form just in some of the more upper dense peaks of this upper density field. So if we make a picture, pictorial picture, because we cannot see it like that, this is just an, uh, an example, we will see upper densities <coughs> surrounded by but galaxies that are tracing this way around each upper density. And the way to measure this is through the statistical tools. So we are going to measure the correlation function that is defined in terms of this contrast of density that is just making the fluctuation of the density over the mean. And then to understand what is the correlation function, we are going to use the probabilistic definition. So the probabilistic definition tells us that if we have two volumes separated by that distance r, the probability of having one galaxy here and one galaxy here, here is given by this expression. And in the case where there is no correlation, correlation is zero, so we will, it will be given only by the number density of galaxies and the two volumes. But in the case there is correlation, positive or negative, the definition is going to tell us this. So it's going to measure kind of the way to the, the matter is agglomerated. And the way to do it with a sample of tracer that is discrete is going to be in this way. So we are going to go through all the galaxies that are our tracer, and we are going to compare how many pairs we have of galaxies at different radius. And we're going to do that for all the galaxies, and we're going to average this number. And it's going to tell you the correlation function. That is for correlated data, but we need to compare it with something. And we compare with data that is not correlated, so completely random. Mm -hmm. And if we make the ratio of votes histograms, we'll have the two-point correlation function. So that is the way to measure it. We are comparing our correlated data with a sample that has no correlation. So if we generalize the definition of the two-point correlation function, but this time two dimensions, what it means two dimensions? So we have, we define an observer, and the observer is looking at the, at the galaxies. So each two galaxies is going to define a direction that is parallel to the line of sight and perpendicular to the line of sight. And this distance is going to be projected in these two directions. And if we do that, we will have this two-point correlation function. So I didn't put this by bad to do it that. At this moment, I would like to show what, how it looks like the BAO in the two-point correlation function in one dimension. So if you haven't seen it, that before, you will see something like this, right? In the case of the two-point correlation function in two dimensions, the BAO is this ring that is a particular scale. This is what we measure, this ring in this two-point correlation function. So again, more statistics. The way to do it this is we can explore, explore the data in the configuration space or in the Fourier space. It's coming. Um, I don't know if someone can unpack it. So the Fourier transform of the correlation function is the power spectrum. <coughs> So now we're going to the measurement. So this is the telescope that took all the measurements. So we used the data of BOSS. BOSS was a survey that took place between 2008 and 2014. It's a telescope that is in New Mexico. Um, it's already over. The data is public. It's the legacy of this experiment to the world. And then the me they measure the spectra of 1.2 million of galaxies and a bunch of quasars. But we just use the galaxy uh, catalogs. So the purpose of this survey was to measure the BO peak with, uh, to measure the peak, uh, the scale of BAO at 1% with a catalog of galaxies. So we use this observable, the BO, 
but not for exploring. The science for this experiment, the science goal, is dark energy. We could use it the same observable, but for, for physics. So how we, how we compute this two-point correlation function? So this is the footprint in the sky of the data. This is the distribution in redshift of the data. We use it both low C and C mass. So we put together these two catalogs and we make redshift beans, slices in redshift, and each redshift bean has been analyzed separately. These redshift beans have some overlap, and we did that in purpose. It's blocking. With this, the last was a real visualization of real data, but we're gonna just see the, the simulation. With this uh, spectroscopy survey, what we have is what we measure the redshifts. The redshifts are, uh, are taken from the spectra, measured from the spectra, so we have in such a way the 3D position of each tracer. And with that, we can map the structure, the distribution of matter of a region of the space. So this is coming from a simulation. So if we have complete information, we will see this structure of the density field. We are not seeing that. We are just seeing points that are tracing this structure of the universe. And this is what we are using for the PLO. So we compute the two-point correlation function. That's for the statistics in Fourier space on configuration space. Here is in configuration space what I mentioned, the BL peak. The BL feature is a peak in the two-point correlation that is at a particular scale, the scale of BL. Here we have the measurements in the Fourier space, the power spectrum. The power spectrum I'm gonna show later on. We will see that it's not this shape, have this shape like this. And this, in, in this the same way, we will have an oscillation. And this oscillation is the BL feature. This is the odd of where the information is. So this is what we have seen before for the power spectrum on the fluctuation of temperature. This is what we see in the case of the galaxies. So this is a power spectrum, what I mentioned before, this has this chain. This oscillation that maybe is not very visible by eye is the BLO, the BLO signature. And here we have the same plot, the variation of N effective. If we eliminate the overall shape of this power spectrum, we already get the oscillatory part that is the BL where the information is. We put, again, as we want to isolate the information just coming from the shift, we're gonna fix a lot of quantities, many quantities, to arrive to this final plot. This is the shift that we want to measure in the power spectrum of the, uh, of the matter. This is how we see it in the configuration space. But we are going to ba go back to that later. Okay, so I put some reference there for the people interested, uh, but I'm not going to them. <coughs> so, I mentioned already, all the information in this, in, in this oscillatory pattern of the power spectrum. Um, I don't know how in detail you want me to, to go through. Um, Okay. Uh, do you want to understand everything, or do you want to understand something? <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Well, in the simplification, what we have is we have we can fix this oscillatory pattern like like this. It's like a sinus, and the frequency of this oscillatory pattern is here, and we are trying to measure a shift that is big. So we are going to parameterize this shift in this way. So we are going to isolate the information on the amplitude in this function, eta. And uh, this is the amplitude of the shift. This is what we want to measure. And here we are going to put all the k dependence or in, in other parts. OK? So this will be the template that is encoding uh, all the dependency of k mode. K mode. So in a VL fit, we want to find the frequency of this oscillatory pattern that is in the free air, in the free air space is that, but in the configuration of the space will be the position of the peak. But in this case, we want to measure this simultaneously to a shift of this frequency. That is kind of difficult, but this is what we do. So we normalize this function in such a way that if we measure 
beta equal to zero will indicate an effective equal zero. If we measure beta equal to one, it will indicate the value of the standard model. Beta is expressed in terms of this quantity, that is the density of neutrinos, and is related to this uh, kind of expression with uh, an effective parameter. And then what we know is that this beta function is a nonlinear function of B effective and N effective. And uh, what happened is that kind of saturated, uh, saturates at 2.45 uh, when N effective goes to infinity. Sorry? All this part ooh, is by definition. <laughs> definition is, is kind of here. It's not complete. That's why I didn't mention that that much. But it's here. It's here where you, look, you cannot see it. OK. So um, I'm going to, if you have questions of that, I will go back to it. I think it's so technical that it's, it's not worth to go through. But we have a template for coming from the cosmology that has several ingredients. We are considering nonlinear evolution, we are considering regime space distortion, we are considering the kingdoms of God, and we, uh, with all these ingredients, we are considering a bias for the for the traces between the relation between uh, galaxies and dark matter. All these are the ingredients for modeling the DLO. And the only ingredient that we are switching is we are adding an extra parameter that is the shift that is, is defined in the way that I already did. We use a template for the F of K. This is a template that we get numerically. So we vary an effective, and then we make this ratio in between the power spectrum wiggle and non wiggle, and we get this pattern, phenomenal, well, numerically, that is this oscillatory pattern. We fit some function to it for make us easier to life, and then we include this template for the k dependence in our analysis. So we have the model for the BAO. We add an extra parameter. This parameter is related to have a template for the shift. And have, we are going to focus and measure the amplitude of this shift. We apply this methodology to validate that uh, with MOX data. We have 1,000 of simulations. So we apply the methodology 1,000 times. And we make some uh, statistics with the results. So here we have how these points are the best fits of each uh, simulation. You can see the alpha is the parameter that is measuring the PO position, <coughs> the frequency of this oscillatory pattern. The beta is measuring the shift in this uh, frequency. Uh, with the simulations, what we can do is that we verify that if we do the distribution of the best fits, we have something that is center on the expected value from the simulation with a width that is related with the dispersion of the methodology. OK? So when we apply this with data, what we get, we are going to focus first in the big uh, contours. We have in blue and in green the contours coming from the two wretched beams of the catalog that are not overlapping. And then um, they they are fitted together. We get an alpha for each one, and this has the contours of one sigma and two sigma for alpha and beta. Uh, this is the, the blue line, is the posterior distribution that is coming from this, from the data. And we see what we see that we, we measure a beta parameter that is not zero. So we are observing. Uh, that we have an effective difference from zero. So we know that this is a very wide, wide, uh, wide posterior. We would like to really check what is, what is the effect of this shift if we put together more information. So for doing that, we have a prior coming from the CMB. While we are doing like this, just because I mentioned the difficulty of this. So we are trying to measure a frequency and a shift of this frequency at the same time. So as we want to explore, this paper was to explore what was the capacity to, to measure this shift, we can fix the cosmology around the, B, the Planck value for alpha, just put in a, a prior on alpha, and check how we can measure the shift. 
and this is what we did. And then these are the two posteriors. Uh, here are just two examples. Uh, this is our main vessel, the red one. And the red one is telling us uh, the case where we are adding a prior coming from the plank with uh, this cosmology. And the prior, again, is just affecting alpha. We know that this prior, we are completely marginalizing all the information coming from the NFT. Because we are really just trying to see the impact of measuring the shift in the VL. And the prior is just to uh, fix kind of the cosmology for alpha. Excuse me. Yeah. You mentioned that beta was the Vita is the amplitude of the shift. Yeah. What, what do you mean? So the <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't, the value outside this and this has no value. In infinite, here is infinite, right? Also, here is the value of n effective for zero and infinite outside this. Yeah, but you, I mean, I, I understand that it's. It doesn't range for the end effect, but uh, in a way you are feeding for beta value. And we are feeding for beta value, uh -huh. yeah. But the, from the posterior distribution, it, it, it looks like you allow negative value of beta. And my question is what it means. I insist uh, beta is the fine dose in this part. I agree no, with you. Yeah, yeah. No, that my question was is to, to the There is no interpretation to, for that. To the as an amplitude, uh, there is no. <laughs> no. There is no meaning that. Okay. So, uh, well, um, yeah. So we did that in the Fourier space, but now with that we, we want to do it also in the configuration space because I mentioned already that the configuration space is a natural space for analyzing the field. So why is more complicated in the configuration space? What is sample? What is very well defined with the K modes when we transform it to the configuration space is just a convolution of modes. So all the information is going to be mixed. So the effect that it was very clearly uh, defined in the Fourier space in the configuration space is kind of mixing everything in a convolution that is very complicated. That is also um, related with the broadband shape here. And the broadband shape means that when we apply a PL methodology, we are just interested in the position of this peak. We are doing all the methodology just to extract this information. We don't care about the amplitude of this correlation function, but the full shape of the correlation function, because all the information is in the PL peak position. Well, this is the same. We don't care, uh, but now, if we want to measure the shift, there will be a complicated uh, relation intra between the, the, the shape of this two-point correlation function and the position of the peak is not, no longer uh, enough for analyzing this. So we apply the same methodology and we get this result. Um, again, this is the the blue and the green contours are coming from uh, the two red chipins just using the VO information. The orange and red are coming from combining this with the CMB prior. And here we have the result uh, for the CMB prior only. So the lesson that we learned from here is that uh, if we check the, the results, they are consistent, statistically talking, but clearly the uh, configuration space has something to, that needs to be understood yet. Um, we have here the distribution of the beta parameter, and we are getting a shifted distribution with our methodology. So we know that the methodology in the configuration space is kind of biased. We also understand where this is coming, and I think just it was uh, outside the scope of this first paper explore it that topic. For in the future, if we want to do it also in configuration space, we need to solve and uh, to understand how to uh, avoid this bias in, in, in our methodology. So in any case, uh, we have a good uh, agreement, uh, well, bias agreement, but they are kind of 
uh, not that bad, operating the bot uh, uh, spaces. So this is our final result. What we call our final result is this, uh, of the parameter beta. So uh, what we conclude from this is that we are excluding with about three sigma beta equal to zero. That is an evidence that uh, we have uh, an effective uh, greater than zero. This is the conclusion of the paper. And um, the predictions is that using this methodology, we are here, again, combining this with CMB. But in the future, we will have uh, these four stage experiments that are going to come in the next decade. And we are going to have a reduce the error bar of the beta parameter in this uh, way. And we will be able to measure this beta probably now with five significance. So I mentioned DESI, and I, I promise that I'm going to talk about, about DESI something at the end. Um, what I mentioned that is that this week is a very important week for DESI. And why is it an important week? It's because we announced on Monday that DESI has the first light started to take measurements the last 22 October. So we are starting uh, an experiment that is going to take data for the next uh, five years and what rest from this year. And we are going to make the most amazing survey ever done to map the distribution of matter in the universe through the galaxies and the quasars. <laughs> and we are going to explore the dark energy physics and try to reduce their bars or at least one stick one, uh, one order of magnitude to try to get some light about this physics that is so amazing. So we, this was a pre-release international, so every single university in the world did the pre-release on Monday announcing this. And we have here two examples. And then, uh, this is what I mentioned, I'm gonna mention from Desi, only if you ask me more, I'm gonna talk more. And I, I mentioned already, ask me. <laughs> I have a 10 slide presentation of Desi. Uh, but just before distracting the conclusion of this paper. So apart from, from the quantitative statement that we, that we mentioned, I think the importance of this is just that the variant acoustic feature was designed, was designed not, but was always used just to extract information about that kind of thing. And the, for, for the first time, we are using this observable for doing something else that is not that energy. We are using it for extracting information about the neutrinos. And that is opening a window for all the people from theory, um, people from particle physics, that want to use this window to, to try to find out the answer that they are looking for. So uh, there are some brothers of this uh, paper that I'm not involved, but I'm happy to uh, promote them, that are using this main uh, observable, the BIO, to extract information also about the inflation, for example. I haven't read them in detail, but the idea is that this window is providing some kind of new information, complementary information. And this is what you should do to try to look new ways of analyzing data. This data is available everywhere. We are in the area of data in cosmology. We're gonna have a bunch of data coming. And at least for the new generation, it's, it's the golden age for trying to imagine new things of, of extract information in cosmology. Thank you.
the main difficulty here is that when you are trying to fit the VL feature, if you do it in a generic, generic way, what we are trying to match is this oscillation, right? So, at the moment, extracted this information given that we have some errors. I don't know if the errors are there. And at the same time, extracting the shift is complicated. So what we are showing, I didn't show this. That should be a plot in there. Let me check. Okay, here. You see? If here. So, in here, we are trying to fit two parameters. The frequency of this and a shift on this. So, for the nature of the data, it's complicated. So, even if you have a very, a very sophisticated model for the VO, that is not the case. But even if you have it, the, the model is not very sophisticated. But it's enough for extracting the VO information, that is just the frequency. But if you want to extract in addition on this shift, uh, you are playing against many things, right? And then what we are showing here in the prediction is that this error is going to decrease with the coming surveys, like, I don't know, 0 0.2 to 0.8. So it's a lot. And just this is coming just because we are measuring with more precision the field also. So you didn't ask me to talk about this, eh? <laughs> but we can show this anyways. So, with DESI, we are going to reduce, we are going to improve the precision in the PL position, in the determination of this frequency by an order of magnitude. So clearly, we are going to have more power, statistical power, to also measure a shift. So now what we are doing is kind of fixing the frequency, and now we can measure a shift. This is what is doing the, the, the prior on alpha. Uh, we have another question. I mean, uh, this is quite interesting. Another difficult? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Actually, I have several questions, but uh, this is quite simple. Even if you don't want to, ask, to answer this question, it's fine. The first one is quite simple. Is uh, once you compute the correlation of this uh, row, you mentioned that you divide or you compare to one that is randomly, mm -hmm. and from what you get the random uh, The second question. Uh, it's just, I don't understand. You said that the, the dark matter, in this case, doesn't move when you were showing the, the evolution, let's say. You said that dark matter doesn't, is not taken into account because you suppose it's, it's, I suppose that it's because you are considering not interaction like photons with uh, the famous activity for the acoustic oscillation. But I, I just was trying to understand if people that is looking for direct detection of that matter, they are relying actually in some small interaction actually of that matter uh, in, uh, with interaction, say, in order to detect the, the nuclear core. If, if they mm -hmm. succeed, let's say, to detect that, it means that they have to modify this. You are at an interaction or? Yes. The point, it means that the that matter will not just stay, will also participate in the if, if I am right, yeah, yeah I, we are thinking here is not interacting just with the parallel photos. Okay, but, uh, and finally, the they are interacting only gravitational. This is what it means. This is the only assumption. Yeah, the, the people that are looking to the direct detection are relying, hopefully, there will be some interaction. Mm -hmm. And my last question is uh, if, if the plot that you show alpha versus beta, there is a, a huge correlation, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you didn't show the value of how do you what is the meaning mm -hmm. beside the correlation? Okay. Because that, that is also play a, a, a role, you would say. It's taking into account, right? When we do the fit with. Let's go with your first question. That is, yeah. So your first question is about the two point statistics. Exactly. So I, I just use it like the more naive 
estimator of the two-point correlation function because it's simpler to explain what it is. Um, I'm already past that? No, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is the the naive uh, estimator. Um, what we use from where come this R? Yeah, yeah. So R R R random points. So the random points if you want to to be very precise. But we are very picky, so they are the most random that we can do it. Random, okay. Why we are comparing this with a random sample? So what the random sample is telling us in the two-point correlations are two things. The first thing is the geometry and the mask of the data. So I don't know if you remember when I put the data, there is the footprint in the sky, and there is also this redshift distribution. So. When you use the random, you are putting all this information of the mass and of the redshift distribution in the randoms to have a fair comparison of the data with the random. That is not a random, but it's the most random that we can have. <laughs> okay, if you have a box with no geometry, with no angular mass, you don't need the randoms. You have an estimator, you are using just this to estimate the geometry. But in a random box, in a, in a box, the randoms, you can compute it analytically, this contribution, and you know how many pairs will be separated by each distance because it's something that you can solve. The randoms are introduced just to have all these borders or this subsampling that are coming for many other effects that I didn't mention either. Even. I don't know, there are regions of the space where there are fewer galaxies because the, this day the observation was very bad and ju we just didn't observe the objects and that's it. And we don't want to compute to contaminate our estimation of the two-point correlation function with astrophysics or with observational systematics or with spectroscopic systematics, whatever. So these randoms are, have this wrong in here. So, it's not very important if there are very randoms, and they're super randoms. The important thing is that they are mapping all the non-cosmological information of the data. Because we are using as a reference for estimating the correlation of the points. So as, as much random as we use, as better the estimator is, as better they are mimicking all the effects in the observational data, we will have a better estimation of the two-point correlation data. So I, I show you the, red, the final result of the two-point correlation function from the collaboration. But just taking these points and eliminating all the effects is 95% of the work. <laughs> After you know, yeah, okay, we have a model, we didn't have changed that much in the last 10 years. Um, we have many goals that are, the, are doing the sampling of the MCMC, whatever, whatever. We have many things to improve, obviously, but the way is already read. We know what to do. In this case, we don't know. We have the data, and we, make, we, we have to make sure that it makes sense. And the randoms is the way that we find to, um, yeah, to, to extract this information and separate it for the systematics. It's already so it's I, I can take the discussion. Uh, uh, it's okay. Okay. Uh, well, just to finish, could you? Well, I have two questions, two comments, or uh, could you show us your last ten slides? Yay! <laughs> and the next, yes, thank you. And the next question. After that, could you show us your first slide? Oh, <laughs> yeah. That is also important. Well, okay. So, very quickly. So. I mentioned this already. DESI is a four-stage uh, experiment. What it means is that we need to improve whatever has been done before to have this new instrument and these new results. That it means a four-stage experiment. And what is happening here now is that the in 2020, we are going to start having a lot of experiments of this four-generation stage. Okay? We have DESI, Euclid, LSST, WFIRST. All of them are going to come in the next uh, ten to five to ten years. Okay, so how this 
uh, separation was created is because sometime in the past, in 2005, some people get together and say, we don't understand what is that, and we need to understand that. And they put together to define what is the strategy to, to, get, to, to get some answer about that, about that. They explore whatever was known at that epoch, whatever experiments were available, and they predicted what needs to be done to achieve a better knowledge of that energy. This is this report, if you want to read it. Um, it's not there. Well, there is one experiment that is coming from this, this exercise. So it's a mid scale, so it's gonna just take data for the lab for 2020 to 25. It's gonna be centered in two observables, bionic acoustic oscillation and redshift space distortion, as I didn't explain. But uh, with both of them, the science goal is to explore dark energy. We have tracers, three different tracers, luminous red galaxies, ELGs, and quasars. And with that, we are using this telescope that is here in Kipik, Arizona, that is there. This is the instrument. The main feature that was developed is that uh, it's composed of this structure. We have 10 petals in each petal. We will have uh, in, in the total 5,000 uh, fibers that will be controlled robotically. So you will see the telescope in action that now is, is in action finally. We have here the focal plane with the 5,000 fibers that are controlled robotically. And then the one observable, second observable that I don't have time to explain. But uh, this is the order of magnitude. This is where we are now, and we are gonna measure this quantity of objects with this new instrument during these five years with these different treasures. 34 in total, million of, um, of galaxies and quasars. And then this is where we are now in the measurements of BAO, where we separated along the line of sight uh, we measure the whole parameter across the line of sight. We measure the, the angular diameter distance. This is more or less what we are now. And with this, we are going to fill all these blocks in the red chip with the different tracers. And we are going to have all these measurements of the VAO in the different slices that will allow us to trace the expansion history of the universe. We are going to reduce the insert uncertainty of the VAO one order of magnitude. We are going to measure also the growth of the structure through the red space distortions. This is the situation now, more or less, of the measurements that we have. And this is where we will be in, in five years with the different tracers. And that, putting together all the information, we expect to reduce the, uh, this is the forecast. Both is the state of art of measurements now. And we're going to reduce that the red contours for the dark energy. So we expect to really achieve a better comprehension uh, or at least reduce the space of parameters for the question of state of dark energy in such a way that we can construct better the models. So the important dates are here. It's not up to date because always it's changing. The survey validation should start already. It started one month later, but everything is going to happen so we expect to start the science uh, next year, uh, sometime in the, in the spring. And we will have a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah.